ancestors that we I'd like to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded Aboriginal territories of the Coast Salish people, and in particular, the Wasanek and uh, Lekwagen, on whose territory we work, live, and play. And sorry, I have to turn off my my mail because I'm getting into it. Um, so, my name is Joanna Fox, and I'm the chair of the Fairfield Kintalis Community Association Land Use Committee, and um, very happy to have you here. Uh, we have also David Malinsky, who's the vice chair, Kevin White, who's the former chair, um, Michael Hello. Hirsch, David Thompson, and Owen Seifer. <clears throat> um, and we have tonight uh, Tom uh, Tanton for 1114 or 1116, depending on how you look at it, McClure, and uh, Keith Tetlow, who is the uh, architect for this project, who's going to be presenting. Um, and as I said, Lois and Monica are on line. Uh, Don Monsour, our president of our community association just joined us. Hello, Don. And um, so the, as we, as you all know, the role of the CALIC is to facilitate the engagement. Uh, we don't make decisions. We don't make res recommendations. Um, what we did do with Tom last year sometime, I guess, was have a preliminary meeting, discuss the plans. Um, and uh, here we are today to have a community meeting. Um, I don't think we have anybody in the community who's on, uh, who is going to be, who is on tonight because of this application. You never know, somebody may join us. Um, so again, our, the purpose is for you to present and tell us where you're at um, and we can then, uh, we can then ask questions afterwards and just make sure you've got everything ready to go forward for your development application. Um, this, because this is still um, in the uh, temporary alternative process as well, your plans will be uploaded to the development tracker and the community members will have 30 days to provide comments and you will receive, and we will receive, and the city will receive copies of those comments. Mm -hmm. um, and if we do have anybody joining us throughout the presentation, um, uh, if you see a name come up, somebody, we just need to record who it is so that we have that for our um, attendance purposes. So uh, how we will work this, as I explained to, to Tom already, he has, uh, he and Keith, I think it's actually Keith doing the presentation, has 15 minutes to uh, show us what their plans are and, um, and then we can have questions after that. And we will be writing a full report and submitting it to the city um, afterwards as well. So, does anybody have any questions before we go further? No. Okay. So, so Keith has uh, has control of uh, his presentation, and so we'll we'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much. Before I start the screen, I um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I've um, I'm a long, relatively long-term resident of Victoria. I, I uh, moved here when I was two. <laughs> uh, it's a 1970, and uh, and basically lived here pretty much my whole life, except for when I went to architecture school in Winnipeg, and then did work session in Vancouver, and also work session in Seattle. But otherwise, I've been here in Victoria, and uh, you guys probably have known <laughs> buildings I've done, uh, and I do. I do pride myself on being kind of a proud local Canadian or local Victorian architect, Canadian and Victorian. So uh, yay, Victoria. Um, and also I, I've lived in this area um, and uh, so I'm, I'm familiar with uh, with the neighborhood. And um, anyway, I'd, before again, before I turn uh, the screen on, I'd also like to give Tom an opportunity to uh, to introduce himself as well right now as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for your, your time tonight. Uh, Keith is going to give you a little tour of our little project. And I guess all of us hanging around to give you some color is required. So uh, without further ado. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm going to thanks a lot, Tom. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, guys. And, uh, and then I think I'll just take it directly here. Um, so here we go. This is um, this is the rendering of, of the uh, project we've we've been working on um, relatively 
early days in the project and but a lot of the big planning moves have been made and uh, a lot of the the decisions on a design sort of front have been also been sort of like made in a sense um, um, and we're presenting those today. Um, as this a little bit of a history that Joanna mentioned that uh, Tom had been in front of of this calic before uh, presenting a uh, what is known as a six pack design with a three basically three townhomes in the front and three townhomes in the back and the co uh, courtyard in the middle. And we, we received feedback that that was not appropriate. That was before I was actually, I shouldn't say we, Tom did because it was before I was hired on. And um, and he he received feedback and, and took that in and, um, and we went back to the drawing board and we've now come up with this, which um, is the effort is here is to um, satisfy the, the, the Fairfield neighborhood plan as closely as possible, to be honest with you, and also to fit. And we'll, I'll show you some of the, the design decisions that, that sort of resulted in this. Now, we're not out to uh, win, um, you know, adventurous design awards with this. <laughs> we are actually just in the, uh, we want to make it uh, be an appropriate addition to this, uh, the streetscape. And, um, I'm just going to zoom in here on the, basically, this is a Google Earth image of, of the neighborhood, you know, so Google, Google Earth does distort the buildings, but you can see um, the character of the neighborhood pretty clearly here. This is the subject house right here on McClure. These are, um, I guess you would call the, um, the, the urban residential form of, of you know, the, the apartments and so on that are on that line Cook Street. And then, but just off of Cook Street, we get immediately into a uh, neighborhood situation, which is, you know, it's a, quite, it's a beautiful street. And we wanted to really respect the, the character of the street and, um, and fully, you know, uh, have the building be not a, not a uh, competition with that or in any way kind of uh, work against anything that's going on in the street. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think that uh, a couple of the things. So we immediately, right from the get-go, we we wanted to essentially uh, focus in on the on the best parts of the traditional type of uh, residential development that one typically finds in the Fairfield area, um, which you can see here, which represents you know lar larger homes, uh, maybe three-story, uh, with a an area in the back, you know. Um, a backyard, a front yard, and then a um, and then a house, which in a, in the in the residential part, and this would typically R one B zoning here, and so um, the way that we set out to uh, satisfy all the various um, requirements and, and so on for the city is is that we essentially took the concept of actually building a uh, a manor house of of an R1B typical zoning situation, and then almost like as a house conversion of one of those. So we actually just designed that. Um, so, um, so here you can see. So this is quite a traditional. It's the arts and crafts, but Tom and I both really like the style, so we just kind of went with it. Um, this, by the way, up the top, this is a dog house of the. It's not in. It's it's this thing over here. I just wanted to clarify that. That's in strict elevation. You're looking beyond to the building beyond there, but. We wanted to show that our height, the height of the building, and we see like this is going to be a theme, the height of the building, the front yard and the, and the rear yard. We tried to contain the building as much as in, in this kind of compact way as possible, which both benefited the rear yard situation and the, and the front yard situation. And, uh, and we think that we've come up with a solution here that is respectful to, to all the setbacks and all the heights that, um, that you know, that basically make it, uh, you know, make it want to make it fit into the this neighborhood as much as possible. Um, we can just gonna here's an existing street shot just for everybody's orientation here. Uh, the Google image is nice. But this one here shows um, this is, of course, the existing house, not our proposed one. Um, our proposed uh, sixplex actually takes up less of the rear yard than this does. And um, the building is essentially in line with the front yard. In, in other words, the buildings, we'll, we'll get into this in more detail when we look into the plans, but the building itself is the same as the, or similar to the existing house. And then we have uh, patios and, 
and decks that uh, balconies that that are uh, projecting into the front yard a little bit a little bit more than this building but uh, we'll get into some more of those details uh, shortly but uh, I think it was important to mm. note that we actually front yard averaged uh, backyard we didn't backyard average at all we actually just mostly went with our 1120 cousins here um, in the similar kind of a, an approach and massing in fact so but uh, we are we're a half a meter lower than that house um, on you know, for an average roof. Here are some zoning statistics which I, I have in the presentation that you guys can take a look at. But there's a couple of, of interesting stats that stick out here. Um, first of all, is we we are our site coverage is a good six six percent. Um, six and a, and a third percent less than our and then the minimum required for the r1b zoning so it's at, at 33 percent so we put a sixplex uh and we actually reduced the amount of foot uh of the footprint of the building and we we stuck it in the ground and we have uh three stories so we try to make it as compact as possible so as to uh, produced as much uh, efficiency in terms of square footage with the least amount of impact on the site. And that's kind of the way that the, the whole thing worked out. Um, we also, the another important part <coughs> to point out here is the um, the three bedroom units. It's uh, It was important to us to address the uh, missing middle initiative that the city is, at, that the members of the Calic are familiar with and essentially uh, having a large enough rentals for families and so on. So that's or not, not rentals, sorry, just the of purchasing stock for, for families that is you know, between an apartment and a single family home, right? So uh, we didn't include the size of these units, but there's the two lower units are about a thousand square feet. The middle units are 1250 and the upper ones are about 15 or 1600 uh, square feet. Um, I wanted to also point out that we have a full, full six spaces, but you know, without, I don't, I'd rather look at plans, you know, instead of numbers. So let's take a look at those here. Um, here's a landscaping plan here. Um, essentially, I'm going to go flip really quickly back to the front uh, uh, rendering here. Maybe doesn't show quite the same extent of rendering or sorry, planting in the front than the, the landscaping plan does. But essentially the idea here is a lower unit here has a patio um, entrance that you go down. It's basically it's a split level situation. So the you go down a half level for the lower unit and up a half level for the middle unit. Um, and, uh, but uh, there's quite a, an effort to um, plant and populate the front yard um, both as a screen, but also as a uh, beautification for for the front, yeah, for the for the front. But as a sort of a screen, a bit of a, a buffer between the patio here, where people could be sitting out, um, and the streetscape, um, so that nobody feels invasive or awkward about that kind of proximity. Um, two bicycle spaces here next to next to that access here. Um, I'm just going through this randomly right now. Uh, sidewalk around this way. Our drive access is, is up on the north is to is obviously to the left here. Driveway access over here, one parking spot per unit, which is something that we we stuck to. Um, there is a uh, an interesting wrinkle here. Yeah. Is um, is that we uh, we also would like the opportunity for each of the units to have a one parking spot at least for uh, and then have the ability to um, to convert these to uh, to actually raise beds in um, in the future if they don't have a car or if they would rather use them you know it for that reason. And oh, how would you have a raised bed in a dark? Uh, Tom can Tom can talk to that. I'm sure we're going to have questions yeah. about that later. Yeah. Right. I, sorry, um, if I can just interrupt. Cool to see. The, excuse me. So I should have said at the beginning we need to give fifteen minutes to the presenter and have questions and answer uh, question and answer period afterwards. And yeah. Can present. Thank you. Yeah, and then um, and then we have the garbage collection area here, which is actually going to be in, in closed in a in a trellis situation, 
And uh, and then we have this little part in here, which is my, my favorite little thing under this beautiful ash tree, which is actually, if you guys have, are familiar with the property, it's a, it's a beautiful tree and we're doing everything we can to celebrate that thing. Well, and, uh, dirty gold bar trees? And Excuse me, can you just turn your mic off until we're finished the presentation? Because if we were in an actual room, we would just have Keith presenting and nobody would be, would be saying anything. Just we need to be respectful of the presentation, please. Thanks, Joanna. I, I forgive you, by the way, everybody. That's okay. <laughs> um, so six uh, six parking stalls. This is a this is a common um, and landscape area here with a barbecue uh, area. But we also thought it was it was important because being the proximity where it is, there's going to be a lot of pedestrian use of this property. There's going to be bicycles. So we uh, secured um, bicycle storage here. And uh, and then so of course you know along with bicycles comes the necessary pumping up the tires and changing of all of us. You can do that all over here in this beautiful little thing. And there's overlook. Um, sorry, I'm speeding up a tiny bit here because I'm noticing the time. Um, we have. Well, I'll go through the plans really briefly. But we basically uh, looked at the, um, the septet requirements for security as well back here because being kind of a secluded backyard we wanted to make sure there was overlook um five of the six units have overlook over to this onto this backyard so um it's it's well um visually supervised shall we say um here's some site plan information with with dimensions um that we don't get on this on the landscape plan and so on, I'd, I'll skip past this. Uh, it does show the driveway adjacent on the uh, 120 McClure. Um, I think it is worth noting at this point where you can really see the relationship of the balconies. Um, the house is actually proposed to be further back itself than from, from this house, the mass of the house itself. The balconies are projecting um, into the front yard in order to give almost like a, a softening of the front facade because it is, it is a block of, of construction. And so in order to break in, up the massing of the front elevation, we added um, patios and uh, balconies there. And that was, uh, I think, quite quite successful sort of de-boxifying of the front facade, if you see what I'm talking about there, as some depths and some interest. And um, oops. And so that's, uh, that's the way that all works out. We can go to the floor plans here. Really, I'll just skip through these relatively quickly. Um, again, there's a lower unit come down into the patio, living bedroom, master bedroom, two bathrooms. Um, the middle unit, which is a mid-size unit here, comes, there's the patio on top of here. So that's stepping down onto the, basically onto the entryway of the, of the unit below. Um, but we come in through this, this zone here. So this is a private patio with no access to the outside directly. Um, interesting little feature here is when you go up uh, at the back here, um, the next floor up, we have a bedroom here, which belongs to the lower story. So the, that has a nice sort of work, a double story uh, working for views and so on for, for those lower guys. So they're not all, all on one unit, or uh, sorry, all on one floor. Um, and then this is the start of the uh, the master, the bigger units, uh, the biggest units, the three bedroom units. This is the open floor, floor plan here. And then you come up the stairs and you end up, oops, oops, sorry, you end up over here on this side uh, with all the bedrooms and so on and so forth. And you can see the overlook and there's lots of visibility, um, no dark, you know, corners and everything. All the, uh, the views are <laughs> obviously to the outside, but, you know, down to the, um, to the backyard as well for security. Uh, because we all do know that uh, this area is quite urban and security is an important part. Some elevations here showing the look of the building, which is a relatively straightforward um, approach to uh, an arts and craft solution. Some board and batten there. Um, and that will be. Um, yeah, uh, colored similar to the rendering, although it will be definitely, that was the first, that was the first crack at the rendering. We'll get it a little bit refined from there. Um, the elevations here for anybody want, uh, who cares to, I mean, it's relatively complex while the stairs going on, but this is uh, just good for heights. If you guys would like to take a look at that. And this here shows exactly how it works in the front with the, the, um, the layered terraces and the balconies and so on. Um, <laughs> 
So um, yeah, this is a letter to mayor and council that I included. Uh, it's a really brief one. Uh, I've done huge ones before, but this is a relatively simple project. And I wanted to just say, you know, we have we we have the EV charging stations. We're using pave, permeable pavings. We're using the edible garden uh, concept as well here as well because both Tom and I really believe in that concept. Um, drought resistant or zero scaping, indigenous planting, uh, which is good for water consumption, and um, and, uh, and etc. We've got step step code three compliance uh, per, per code requirement as well. So, um, but essentially, uh, you know, the, the fact that a third of the property is available for open space is really, um, really an important stat. I wanna just bring that up here. Um, we got the open site space is 35%. So that is kind of reflected here. And the open site does not include driveway too. And we have a lot of drive aisle here. So really this is, a you know, a cubic plan with um, articulation of an arts and crafts type style, but the emphasis is in the landscaping and also um, and uh, and with the incorporation into the neighborhood fabric. Those were our major points. So I think at that point, unless uh, Tom, I, if, did I miss anything? If not, I will I will uh, turn it over at this point. I think to uh, to questions. Oh, flip it to the front image. Or this page actually is a good one because it has all everything here. So thank you very much um, for allowing uh, me the opportunity to present this in front of you guys. Thank you. Thank you, um, Tom. I think he's Tom was saying something, but your mic. Oh, <laughs> Tom, you're muted. <laughs> it... <laughs> can you ask him maybe to unmute? I can. Uh... Might rather have me. There you go. Whoa, there you are. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Okay, super. So, did, did you want to add anything to Keith's presentation, Tom? No, I think Keith covered all the bases. Um, if there's any questions, I can help Keith out on those. But okay, let's so, talk about raised beds. Um, uh, so generally, what we do with uh, with these community meetings is we turn this over to. Um, the uh, community members who are in attendance, and um, they are permitted two minutes, two minutes uh, to ask a question, um, and uh, of either Keith or Tom. Um, I'm just looking at the list here. Loreen Belland has joined us. Um, sorry, we need to just get names for the report, um, and I just see if there's anybody else who's joined us. Uh, I don't think so. Um, so, do we have do we have anybody in the audience um, who would like to ask a question of either Keith or Tom? No. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, I I missed the square footage for the for the ground for the basement ground floor. Two bedrooms. Oh, okay. Um, we didn't. I mean, it's not officially part of the oh, presentation, please. but I, it's a it's a thousand and thirty six square feet, I believe, for the lowest yeah. unit. Yeah, something similar, very close to that. So the it's lower, crazy. yeah, the lower unit is just over a thousand square feet. It's a, bit, a bit smaller than the other two bedrooms on the main floor. Yeah, and then and then the middle units are are about 1250 and the upper units are about 1600 or so. Yeah, the top unit is just over 1500, I think. Oh, okay, just over 15, yeah. Um, and, and they are um, strata, correct? Correct, sure. yes. Okay. Um, and the only other thing I, I actually had to ask was, um, and this came in the form of a copy to the city letter, um, in whoever was writing it was in support of um, of the development with the caveat that they thought um, giving the uh, the condo owners the choice of how to use their parking spot um, was could backfire because uh, somebody could have a car, choose to park it on the street and use their parking lot for raised beds. 
um, and she didn't think that that was a um, uh, wasn't she didn't look really like that idea because apparently on McClure uh, street parking is at a premium. So um, that you can choose to answer that if you would like. But um, I just I guess the question is how do you get around like when you have a requirement for the city for parking spaces for the units how do you then get around the fact that they're that they can choose not to use it for their car even if they have a car can i speak to that keith yeah i was gonna say that would be good for you to do that yeah yeah it's an interesting thing joanna but what we've learned we want to have one space per unit which is pretty typical for this kind of a building um the city actually is uh doesn't really care that much about parking anymore <laughs> parking is getting kind of controversial too isn't it but um, we wanted to actually keep one parking stall per unit, knowing the city was supportive of even four. I mean, not that we were looking for that. They were kind of telling us they'd rather see that and have more green space. So we're kind of in the middle of the private side and what the city's looking for. So we've elected this idea of having the six spaces, but giving the owners a choice, knowing the city would support. If somebody didn't have a car, they could still have their space, perhaps sell it to their neighbor, convert it to a raised bed, as long as it was a portable raised bed that could be deconstructed if they ever sold and turned back to a parking stall. So I thought the flexibleness of that was a, a really good idea, but it worked for everybody. Uh, Lorraine Bellin here just piping up. Would uh, are, Is the parking not uh, under cover? Uh, how, would it, how would a raised bed be, uh, how would things be growing in a parking area? I'm, I don't get that. Yeah. No, I'm, says, I'm, I'm a personally, I'm a gardener, so yeah. wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be in the yeah. dark? They're not well, under. It's not undercover. Yeah. That's the, that, Lorreen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it might be a bit confusing. Last summer, when I spoke to Calic, we were considering some covered parking in the back. Mm -hmm. we found pretty early in the game, the big ash tree roots were a problem with any kind of building in the back. So we kind of forced to stick with this surface parking, uncovered parking. Um, one of my concerns, of course, in a, a, a backyard with the south facing building is you have a little bit of limited sun, but we still have a fairly deep backyard and in summertime, especially we get super amount of sun back there. Mm. I think you'd be more inclined to grow some fruit trees that are a touch more shade friendly. But again, it is not a shady place. It is a very sunny place. Oh, okay, that that answers my question. I, yeah. I think it's an excellent. Uh, I, I'm totally in support of this. I mean, I don't even, I don't live in the neighborhood. I live in Gonzales Bay, but I, I, I totally think it's an excellent project. And I, 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 uh, I, I wish all the best to you. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you know, we, we tried to please Calic. Uh, we tried to keep the city on side. And yet most importantly, I think is really the community. And so far, everybody's liking it. That one was qualified for sure about the, the parking idea. But uh, no, uh, we've tried hard and I'm seeing we're getting some good feedback and it really feels good. Thank you. Um, well, I'm flattered that you tried to please Calic because that, that's really, it's really not our role, but that's nice to hear that, uh, um, that you, were, uh, you were thinking of us that way. You guys are the face of the community to me anyway. I mean, you know, other than the immediate neighbors, so. <laughs> um, um, so I have a question. Um, just, I'm curious from the previous Calic meeting, what was the main concern um, for the for the six pack, the original uh, development? Yeah, can I speak to that too, Keith? Um, yeah, this be yeah, you were there, not yeah. me, so it'd be more yeah. great. But you do, I could share. Um, I'm just gonna uh, go. Do you want me to bring up that plan? Is it? I don't That's know if it's worth it, but anyway, we could go, go ahead, Tom. I'll, I'll bring yeah, all this. Yes, I can speak easy to it. Um, I was quite inspired with abstracts of brownstone over in Chester Street. I thought it was a very efficient design. I thought it was a little bit bulky for the site, but I thought I'd try something similar. This site's a fair amount bigger than that Chester Street site that it is in brownstone. So I had uh, three units in the front, parking courtyard in the middle, and the three units facing the rear. Um, everybody liked it, except for the city. Uh, the city didn't feel it was uh, commensurate with the traditional residential, you know, the big backyard thing. And my case against it was, or, or for it rather, was we have the apartments on the three sides, which are all basically asphalt backyards, not respecting any kind of traditional backyard. 
And that would be a transition to the uh, more traditional D for backyards to the rear. But the city just wasn't comfortable about it. So I thought rather than fight everybody, I'll find something that works better for, for everybody. But I really like the layout. It's very efficient. Um, there's no stacked units. I'm not a big fan of stacked units. The side by side have some benefits, of course, but uh, I just didn't think I'd have the, the, the support on it. This, this, I, no, oh, you don't have this, sorry. Um, I would have to stop sharing in order to yeah. get this onto the, uh, anyway, it's okay. Never mind. Did you, um, did you not also have a, a parking, like you had covered parking with the idea of a green roof? Well, we, we roof. did, Joanna, but again, the, enemy, it, yeah. the enemy was with the Arborist report, they want such a big, huge root zone uh, without any kind of an, you know, foundations or excavation on them. It really killed any thoughts of having any you know, bearing walls or anything for carports. So uh, we got the next best thing to a green roof here, I guess. And a little bit of green in certain parts. No, it looks, I know, I just, that, that's what I was remembering. So I was, yeah, just, yeah, no, I, I thought it was a nice thing, but yeah, the tree roots just killed it. They, they really did. Well, you don't want to kill the tree roots. Well, no, they won't let me, even if I wanted to, but, but I don't want to. It is a nice tree. Just a follow up question um, for uh, Tom or Keith. The, the lower suite, there's no bedroom on the sec, on the above floor, right? So it's, their whole unit is on the same floor, correct? Yeah, this one here, uh, David, Kevin, sorry. Yeah, this is, this this one, yes. This one, the lowest unit is all on one floor. Right. Is there any, if, if the owner, if the owner, if you had these pre-sales, is there any chance that the owner of one of those units, um, suppose that they were in a, in a, in a wheelchair, um, could there be wheelchair ramp access to one of those lower units? As a possibility, we just we, we hear that quite often in Calic that uh, some of the developments that come through um, are not uh, are not conducive to uh, people with wheel in wheelchairs. Yeah, well, they they would have. Uh, I could answer this one without. With, there are there are lifts that we could put. We have the concrete. Um, uh, um, you know, we can just get. This is the only part that we've got to get down a half flight of stairs, and we can have um, exterior. Uh, like lifts that can be added after the Graventa lifts um, uh, can be added as an as a feature to this with and then the rest of it would be would be accessible but um, you know there's it's going to be hard to get to the master bedroom here without the door like there's there's some features of this that are not um, are not I mean it's not terribly unfriendly but there are going to be some challenges to to operate like in this bathroom for, with a wheelchair and so on and so forth too yeah so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not upgrade friendly for a wheelchair at this point in time. Yeah. Thank you. Not really. I mean, I mean the details, right? Because you would, you'd want to have a larger bathroom. You'd, you'd want to uh, have your doors need, need like space beside them so you can open the door and get your wheelchair in there too. So there's some modifications that we could make here, but this, this particular plan is not upgradable um, super easily. Thank you. But we might, we might actually, we might want to consider. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll talk to Tom. But we, we may wish to consider doing a small number of these sorts of things, um, you know, for, for it because there's no, there's no problem with that. And to be honest with you, from a design point of view, I actually like the uh, handicap unit, um, the space that does, you know, that comes with those. So it just requires a little bit stealing from here for there. Is the with the ground floor unit, and I'm not sure about the second the first floor but is the access for the ground floor unit only in the front there's no back door right no um so that's right okay. yeah okay, so to get around to your car you're going down the driveway that's correct in this particular because because we have the bike parking along this part right here and that kind of and we needed the entire the entire side for for that use and then we thought that and bike parking and storage by the way for each that's one thing that that I didn't talk about, but we have like good storage for each of these units as well. That was seen as a as a desire by exterior storage. So you could put your whatever golf club, surfboard, whatever you might have that you would put in a basement of a house, you would have that storage unit. So we we maximize the size of that there. And we have of course egress, the window egress out of the bed bedrooms for safety, but there's one door, main door access, yeah. Any, any other committee members have any questions or comments? 
Yeah, I've got, I've got one, Dave Thompson here. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, this is a, a question of genuine curiosity. It's not a, a suggestion or anything, but I'm just wondering about the broader sort of neighborhood context. And I see you're located between a sixplex that is taller and a sort of a box style walk up apartment building. And then you've got a taller building in behind. And I'm wondering why not raise it up a little bit and give a bit more light to the basement units. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting comment. I uh, I think that it's a it's a question. If we did that, then it would it would possibly end up feeling a little bit more monstrous. Because at the end of the day, I mean, monstrous isn't really the the, the greatest term to use because I don't want to leave that one. But but it is seven thousand square feet overall. This building, and so that's a that's an that's a that's a size. So um, there are requirements on like when you get the weight of the building to actually have it sunk down a certain amount just for stability, right? You don't have it on the surface because um, the foundation won't like that. But um, so there's a little bit of a desire to just sink it down just for the weight of the building is kind of like a boat, you know, it actually works like that. Um, but uh, it is it is an interesting thought maybe to do that. And um, Did I haven't touched my color key. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, it's actually a, a fairly constrained building. Uh, one of the vertical constraints is we have to have two and a half, sto two and a half stories maximum. And we can't do that if we're out of the ground anymore. So unfortunately, it's something that the city bylaws are driving, not really what we'd like to do. And the irony is we'd have accessibility to that bottom unit very easily with it out of the ground more. We wouldn't be that much bigger than our surrounding neighbors, but we just can't please the city with it. So it's sort of trying to make everybody kind of happy. <laughs> but yeah, it just it, it's tough, it's tough. We yeah, think about the two and a half story for the zoning. That's true. I yeah. Think about that detail. Yeah. yeah. And that so, and that way, the way they count the zoning is like is like that. You have to have it mostly under underground, yeah. that first floor. Thanks. That's the technical answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had a couple of simple questions. If yeah. if I'm allowed. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I noticed you mentioned EV charging at the end. There was the idea that you would be um, electrifying each of the stalls or actually providing shared charging infrastructure or individual charging infrastructure for each stall. And then uh, the other question, oh, go ahead. There's a requirement for the for all new, new construction to have an EV charger. Uh, there's only a requirement to have one per building. Um, yeah, and so to share that, uh, we're into technicalities there that I'm not sure that I have familiarity with. This is a relatively new uh, requirement from the city, and so it's my understanding that we will have we'll have the single charging station, um, and that uh, you know we'll have to just I guess have come up to some kind of smart way of putting it in the parking situation so that um, so that uh, there is some flexibility there in terms of access. Yeah, right. can I maybe? Yeah, that's that's a that's a detail that I haven't really you know wrapped our heads around one hundred percent. Fair enough. Yeah. Can I uh, build on that question a little bit? Um, is is there an opportunity to do any um, uh, uh, work in advance to rough in uh, to allow individual stations later because it's going to be near impossible to retrofit that afterwards. Uh, or the, like the cost is going to be so prohibitive can you rough in wiring now so at least it could be contemplated in the future can i put my developer on for a sec here keith and just yeah just some of these things yeah. um we definitely want to do all these things it's whether we can afford to do all these things rough ins though are basically a compromise but they also do the hard part of the work for anticipating them for the future so i think we can speak to rough ins as we'd all like them but maybe only having the minimum electrified right now. Having said that, even our bike, long-term bike storage has got uh, charging for electric bikes. So we are kind of thinking of the future as good as we can here, but it's hard to say, yeah, we're gonna do everything and then try to actually, I don't wanna be a politician, but I wanna be honest. <laughs> so yeah. we, we can do rough-ins. 
I would hope that um, on a landscape situation where we have permeable pavers, which are unit pavers, actually, and they, um, you know, uh, to, uh, I actually just put a, a charger in, a, in an apartment building not long ago, and, and because it's on the exterior, it's not quite as, as hard to do to deal with um, running a line as inside of a building. So there is ability to kind of lift the pavers up and and dig down and, and then put it back together again. So it's not entirely impossible to add more chargers over time. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it looks like um, if you ran, I, I don't know the technical details, of course, but if you ran conduit out and then sort of behind each of the six parking spaces, mm. uh, like towards the perimeter of the property, I don't know if that's permitted or not, yeah. but, uh, that could avoid some trouble. Just let me just again, if I can just interject here, yeah, rough are great for all this stuff. And besides rough ends, we also have to have capacity. So, we rough ends, we haven't got the power supply, the rough ends don't matter. So, all these things are kind of balls in the air right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're certainly trying to figure out our power supply for the entire project, you know, electric heat, heat pumps, EV charging, what degree of each, all these factors are at play right now. So we want to do the best we can do for it, but it definitely means some degree of rough-ins for a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be it would be nice. So it, I definitely do foresee, um, you know, a, a little modicum of landscape lighting because it's a nice nice landscaping back there, and I would you know anticipate, but <clears throat> just like low voltage stuff, so that we could have electricity out there. Mm -hmm. We want to have something for security anyway for people. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Owen, did you have another question? Yeah, just a, a very brief one. Uh, I heard you mention, Keith, these uh, other two bicycle spaces, I guess, along the, uh, is that the eastern property line there? Or are those meant for kind of short-term visitors? Yes, exactly. Just visitors. Okay. Great. Thank you. Oh, I had something. Oh, I, yeah. So you mentioned heat pumps. Um, so I, is this just the, when you mentioned that, Tom, are you saying that you're, all these are considerations right now? And so you, you're still finalizing that because I know heat pumps are um, becoming uh, quite popular. A lot of uh, yeah. grants and uh, available for those because they are more environmentally um they're more environmentally. Uh, Absolutely. Um, yeah. The enemy of heat pumps is their cost, obviously. But the problem with going with good old electric baseboards for heating a big place like this is you need huge power service for the site. So it's the cost of the extra service size for electric baseboards, which really aren't that great compared to heat, pump, heat pumps. So maybe we just go to heat pumps and, of course, all the government grants on top of it. Again, it's one of those balls in play because it's quite a tuning for all this. Our envelope systems compatible with our mechanical systems, etc. And we're working with a couple of designers right now uh, on the you know the BC Clean BC program stuff and the Step Three and Step Four code. Actually, uh, we were told by somebody we may be able to get Step Four on here with heat pumps with the grants they're having right now. Wouldn't that be good if we could pull that off? But again, I just don't know at this time to commit. To that. We're just trying. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that you guys are aware, like the, these drawings are, well, these are the first, basically the zoning and the design drawings. We have an entire uh, sort of set to come up with in terms of the details for mechanical and construction details and, and such and such. So it's kind of, it is sort of early days in terms of documentation. These are interesting thoughts, interesting, very interesting. Well, the, the, inter the, the thing with the heat, the heat pump discussion is, um, you know, more and more we've been seeing that, uh, you know, there are less and less parking stalls required because you, because a lot of people don't have cars, choice, uh, choose not to have cars. And, um, and there's, you know, the, um, the bike parking and the bike storage and the bike maintenance areas and the electric bike plugins, all that stuff, I mean, is awesome. Um, again, for people who have that environmental consciousness. And so my thought, is maybe you know okay it's maybe more expensive to have the heat pump uh, all, um, option however you get a different type of buyer right yeah. and um, so somebody who, who wants to have that and feels good about living in a building that is not destroying the planet like you know gas for example 
if I can add, Joanna, back to the sort of uh, all the balls in the air and see how they land. Uh, if Keith can maybe show you the elevation of over top of the secure bicycle, the rear bicycle storage area. It's, it's a flat roof and that flat roof is kind of intended for putting heat pumps on. Oh, cool. So if you look at the rear of the building, Keith can show you with the cursors there or something. That's a flat roof. That is a perfect place for a bunch of heat pumps. And it's also a centrally located place. So again, we're, we're trying to hedge here a bit, but we are considering these things and trying to be realistic about it. So we promise heat pumps, we actually have a place to put the darn things. And, you know, that's the way and, we are right do, now. Do heat pumps make noise? I mean, we have a heat pump. They, they do have some noise. So that's yeah. a good is it not? The fan, use, yeah. the fan ones do. Yeah, the fan, the air, the air unit ones do. Yeah. 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 Which um, is the only type that we have option yeah. of using here, really. Yeah. But that can be mitigated. I mean, technology is helping on that a bit. I think the location is helpful on that as well. Um, yeah. So, very well, right? Yeah. That where the heat pumps are, that build the, that building with the two top little windows, that is that the stairwell? Going up. Sorry, I, I I didn't hear that, Joanna. You quite uh, quite the stair this this one here. This is yeah. this this one here. Yeah, this is the cent. This is the basically the the back door access to the upper units. Actually, um, I just if you just here just <laughs> if you had I guess if you had the heat pumps along the top of the bike parking, yeah, they exactly they're against is the stairwell. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Against the stairwell here. Or the master and, bedrooms. Yeah, and then there's master bedrooms here. This well, this is the lower floor, and it comes up, and then oh yeah, uh, exactly. yeah, and then the higher floor is this guy here. So, but again, there are bedrooms there. There's no question about it. So, yeah. <laughs> so there are ways of mitigating that to sounds and vibrations, etc. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. interesting. Any anything else? Any other thoughts, people? have or like to share i'm sitting there looking at um Sorry, guys. Uh, the master bedroom for the ground floor shares a wall with the kitchen of the top of the main floor and i guess i'm looking at it going well what would be better would you want to share a wall with the kitchen or would you want to share yeah. a wall with the living room but then you're not going to put the kitchen at the front of the house yeah. And so is it better to have, like, are you finished in the kitchen before you're finished in the living room when people are trying to sleep? Yeah. It, it, it's actually the second bedroom, Joanna. It's not the master bedroom. Oh, it's not the master? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, then it's the guests or the kids. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you have crammed a lot in, the, not crammed, you, you put a lot into the building space. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it, it's very efficient, actually. There's like very, yeah, the very efficient plan. So, so if we don't have any more questions, um, I would like to thank Tom and, and Keith. Um, the next step for this is to, um, we'll write a report and send it to the city, basically uh, just capturing today's discussion. Um, and then you will be submitting your application for rezoning with your plans, which will go up yep. on the development tracker, which then people can comment uh, for 30 days if they choose. And, um, and then it's, uh, it, it continues um, down the path. And the rezoning path. path. Yeah. Through the path, <laughs> along the path. Yeah. yeah. So we wish you luck. Uh, it's been interesting following um, the development of this. And uh, um thanks for going through the process with us thank you very much thanks yes, again for your time everybody yes and thank everybody for your time we really do appreciate it it's a, a good number of people watching so thank you all for coming yeah yeah you're welcome and if you have any more questions just send us an email um and uh and we'll do what we can to help you out yeah good luck with your project thank you okay thanks. So we're, going to, we're going to continue um, okay so we'll leave off. Yes, we'll, you can leave. Yeah, we'll, we'll take off. Stay okay. too, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 Yeah. See ya. Um, okay, so we now have um, Monica uh, and Lois. Uh, you, are you there, Monica and Lois? Because we can't see you or hear you. Joanna, should I stop recording for this part?
Um, no, we're still we're still in the in the community meeting. We're good. Thanks, Owen. Okay. Hi. Hi, Monica. And we'll just wait. Lois is. Let's get my other. Do you know if Lois is joining us, Monica? Well, now Monica's frozen. Um, I will just, while we're waiting for Lois, I'll explain um, why they got a hold of us. Um, so, if you recall, uh, one one. One 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 seven one Rockland. Uh, a couple of years ago, geez, I think it was May 2019. Um, we had a community meeting um, with the owners, and they had bought that um, grand old dame who's on the corner of Rockland and Linden, and it was a roomy house. I think it had 12, 12 rooms, and. Uh, um, anyway, so they bought the building and I think it was legally, I'm trying to remember now, um, it was, it was zoned, it was zoned for six unit, but it had like 12 units and anyway, they were trying, they basically wanted to make it more livable and, um, uh, and they were creating eight units and we're upgrading all the power and doing a whole bunch of things to make it, um, uh, to keep it as a as a beautiful house, but also to to make it more efficient for people to uh, to live in um, and rent. I'm pretty sure it's a rental. Yeah, Kevin, thank you. So um, yeah, Lois, it's it's been eight for quite some time. It's been eight for quite some time. Okay, so um, Lois is the neighbor on Linden. Um, this this did go to uh the city um they just applied for a, a variance permit um because one of the units is very very small apparently it's not that small compared to some of the condos and stuff downtown but the city felt it was too small uh it was undersized at 300 square feet and so they didn't grant them the permit so um i think they're now uh I'm not exactly sure what they're doing, but that was only on the 11th of February. Um, they did also have uh, some exterior changes. One was an entrance door uh, on the ground floor, which I think um, is on the same is on the south side, so it faces the Linden property, and the dormer, which is on the south side and faces the Linden property, they had. Um, asked to have that enlarged and I remember this actually from their the community meeting when, when we were there uh, because the they were creating two different rooms and they needed to have two windows which is one window anyway that the enlarged dormer and the entrance door was approved by the city of Victoria so um, the Correct me, like jump in any time here, Lois and Monica. I'm just telling you what I'm thinking, what some of the issues are. Um, the, uh, they also had um, independent meters uh, for all of the units, which was new because they never used to have that. Um, and so the meters were originally on the south wall. Um, I don't know what precipitated them moving it, but they then built a shed. Uh, an outbuilding that is on Linden Avenue to house all the uh, meters that I actually saw a picture of it when you guys sent me the emails and I can see why there was concern about it because it really stuck out like a sore thumb. Anyway, that got taken down and now the meters are on the south side of the building. So that's, um, as far as I know, they're gonna be applying for a variance on the one unit again uh possibly and the sheds down and that's all i know so you had contacted us because you had some concerns and some questions and we're here to listen lois did you want to start or did you want me to go ahead if you want to start monica that would be great 
Um, so again, I, I'm in the Rockland Neighborhood Association, so I didn't, I wasn't clear, I think, on some of the boundary lines, but the outbuilding was what got a lot of attention. Um, and then I went through all the material on February 11th, and I was moved to call in to that public meeting because it just looked like, it just looked like Lois was kind of on her own. Um, and if you look at the letters of support, the letters of support say for the safety and et cetera, et cetera. And, and yes, the internal work to update the wiring and any kind of fire exits or whatever, that's true about the safety. But the other issue, all the other issues to the external where Lois is directly impacted, it just didn't seem like anybody was listening. And to her credit, though, she sent another letter with pictures on February 8th. And that outbuilding, I believe, is what got some of the council members' attention, which is why then they maybe declined the variance permit, because it's just a question of good faith. And that's where I understand in the documents that I sent to you, I had used the term specification. And yeah, I could. it's probably more of a conceptual design from architects that get presented and put forth. But when they go through a number of revisions, then what, you know, it's, it was just the questions about what the approval process is. Um, no mention of the maple tree that's low on Lois in the, the size of that property. Um, anyway. What's the maple tree got to do? I'm sorry, I left my camera off because my internet seems to be kind of sticky, so. That's okay. Um, so, um, so the pro, I guess to try and help to try and answer the process, I think I answered it in, in the email today, but just the, the process is that the applicant goes through the preliminary meeting, we have an informal chat with them, they come back, and maybe they've made some changes, maybe they haven't, and they have a community meeting that the community is invited to. Um, and it's like what we did earlier that you were part of. And, um, and from there, um, then the applicant gets their application ready for the rezoning or variance or whatever. Actually, sorry, if it's a variance, it doesn't even come to us. We, do, we don't get involved in development variance permits, but at the time it wasn't a development variance permit. It was um, something else and I just can't remember. So, so there are changes, there's always changes. Um, there are revisions and that's what the development tracker is all about because all those revisions get posted on the development tracker. So if anybody's interested in following it, the development of a pr proposed property, um, that's really where the information is. And the mayor and council emails and et cetera are there, the development developers information is all there and the community member can, can contact who, whom they like and are encouraged to do so. Only when there's, you know, as I said, uh, some very, very, uh, large revisions um, that were, I guess, maybe out of the scope of what was uh, originally planned. Um, would we even consider having a community, a, a second community meeting? And in my experience, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Kevin's the same. I, I've only ever seen that happen once, and and we were directed by the city to do it um, because there was a lot of um, there was a lot of. Uh, controversy over uh, over the project, um, and so uh, really, um, I I don't I don't know how what we can do as the Calic uh, with your concerns um, because the process that they're going through is as we would follow it, and it's really up to the city um, and the and your communication with them and it sounds like you are communicating with them and it sounds like some of the things you've brought forward to to them have resulted in um, change like getting that shed taken down yes um <clears throat> i this is lois here i the homeowner um it just has been a frustrating situation because the homeowner wasn't um, open about all these changes when he originally approached me to sign. Um, it was just the approval to make 
two illegal suites legal. And then I found out much later um, in 2020 that he was planning these other changes, which really affected me, um, breaking through a stone heritage wall, putting a path right at the property line between our two um, properties to a new door, a second door into a, um, a studio basement apartment when there is already a door. Uh, it just seems that, um, and it's only would be used by the one studio tenant. And it just seems all this is coming about because he wants to turn a studio into a one bedroom for one tenant. Was that, was that studio there before? Yes, it's a, it's a basement suite. Um, I've lived in my house for 40 years. So I was there when they were the 12 housekeeping units and, um, and it's never been a problem. But I guess I, I just felt that the architect um, wrote a report saying that this was very minor outside changes and it was due to a security issue with vagrants on the um, Rockland side of the property, which really wasn't the case. Putting a third entrance into the, into the, onto the property, I feel is a more of a security issue. So it's just, I never really, I didn't know these meetings were going on. I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. I was told when I, when I heard about them from the owner to uh, write a letter to the, for the council meeting. So I, I did a letter July 9th, 2020, and that it never made it to the meeting. It just got approved by the senior heritage planner. Um, you know, it's been hard finding out how things got approved and who did it and, and um, you know, but I felt I never really got a say until this shed was built. And, and then I went to the city council meeting and then brought up the other items. That's, it, that's, that's very unfortunate because I, and I know you also had said you never received the initial um, notice for the community meeting back in May 2019. No. And that, that, that is not, you're not the first person to, to tell us that. And that's um, unfortunate. And as I said, we've started promoting these meetings on other uh, platforms, not just relying on the mail outs. Um, and um, I, yeah, I'm not sure what to tell you. I, I mean, the, I guess you've got some time on your side because the variance permit wasn't approved. Mm -hmm. um, and um, have you been in touch with the planner for this property? I think it's John O'Reilly. Yes. Yes, I spoke to him and he said he had approved it. Um, and then I did find out, I think from, oh, actually my partner talked to the owner the other day and he said that John O'Reilly had given him approval to, to build the shed and an electrician had as well. So um, it's just a little bit scary with these other plans because the architect's not really being specific about things. It's just a very, he put two windows, I think, on the side of the, of the south side of the property when there's four and, and it just, um, you know, it's a very narrow area. They have, uh, I believe it's five feet, seven inches to, to put this down, to build a fence, have a, uh, a path. It's, we're very close together. Yeah, I saw your pictures. The, the property mm -hmm. lines are, like those houses are very close to the property line. Mm -hmm. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get that today, that's for sure. Um, no. So when you have changes like that and yeah. the, the houses are so, so close to each other, they're, um, I mean, usually that's taken into consideration. And I remember when the, with the dormers, um, I, I thought this came up in, in the presentation. It was the, it, I mean, the dormer was already there. So the dormer was already looking to your house. Um, it's just now a bit wider. And, mm -hmm. uh, I'm and not we've, sure. got a, we've got a bathroom skylight and we're just concerned. Has anybody looked to see that, that they won't be able to look right down into our bathroom? because the drawings are, are quite unspecific. Um, it's just, I guess the next step would be to take it back to the city then. Is that 
what you would recommend? Well, yes, um, because it's it's what you're. I mean, I think you've already helped me out here, guys. If you have any any um, suggestions, but I think the fact that you've brought attention to the city about the shed and the shed is now gone. Hmm. Um, I don't. Hmm. I don't think a planner can approve the outbuilding, though. Like I, that's a that does doesn't make sense. So I, I'm I'm. Yes. Hi, I'm, yeah. I'm Lois's partner, Chris. And there was no permit on it. Yeah, I mean, that was a significant building. That was like, and it does look like an outhouse. It's pretty. Um, yeah, it, hi, hello, it's Chris, Lois's partner. Uh, we're just trying to figure out where does this approval come from? It seems there was no building permits for the, the new door and for building the, the sidewalk and the new gateway. Well, I think what you have to do is you have to go back and I, I sent you this link in the in the email. I sent you the link to the development tracker. And if you go back, uh, if you look at the development tracker and you go back by date, you see every revision that they have, they have to provide the information to the city on that. And so they there's usually a letter and there's usually some plans and it explains what the what the revisions are. Um, so I I, I, in hindsight, I don't know if I saw anything. Um, I did. I have gone all through that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think I see. I saw anything about the shed. When I asked about the shed, it was all about the the meters, and it was something about how. Um, that wasn't on that first that first iteration, right? Well, like when you look at the first iteration, no. some of it no, no, wasn't. No, no. That's what I mean. In 2019, when he met with you, that was a very different iteration. Yeah, and that happens. Like the, the, of the plan. Yeah, they. But but if they're right. Uh, but they're still. You can't put up a, an outbuilding anyway. Um. So basically, I think. I think you you just got to keep on the same. On the same track, and um, as I said, you bought yourself some time, or you haven't bought yourself some time, but they didn't approve the uh, the variance permit, so. There's going to be a bit of time um, to get your argument there and to get some support from your neighbors, which you apparently have. Yeah. Hi, it's Chris again. Am I correct in saying that if you're a heritage registry, that you need city council approval for exterior changes? That's what I read today on, on the city website. So if it's not city council approving a new, new doors into the building, um, it sounds to us that it was John O'Reilly who gave these approval and does he have jurisdiction to do that with a Wait, well if he's the heritage planner for your area then mm -hmm. i i think he probably does um okay. you know i i own a heritage house and we've done a bunch of stuff and and it was always the heritage planner that we were dealing with okay um, thank you yeah it wasn't the city council but, but i don't know if the heritage i don't think the heritage planner would have had like all those pictures that we have now, the way that we've documented it, that's, and then maybe that has to go into the heritage department because maybe that would just get their, get his attention a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, um, I keep fighting. Um, I mean, the more, I mean, when I saw the pictures, I have to agree with you, right? Like, it's just, it's really close. So, um, that, you know, you want to, you want to, it's hard. I mean, we've been in these meetings where we've had two neighbors arguing um, because somebody just spent a whack of money on new windows and uh, the person who wants to build the building is uh, going to be much closer to their house and all of a sudden they're going to be able to look in look in their new windows and they're like mm -hmm. they just want to move they don't want to be there anymore yeah uh, I mean I knew nothing about this I was woken up at 7 30 in the morning with with a backhoe in the yard and this um shed went up and it was going to have a 15 foot conduit coming out of the top and um, I just felt I could do nothing about it. He just said, oh, it's all approved. And people mm -hmm. were walking by horrified. And then they put a note on about the, the city council meeting. And that's the only reason 
why I felt I had a say because he's been telling me all along that everything's approved. And um, well, I think you know you've yeah. answered your own question because you you thought you couldn't do anything about it and you you've enabled getting the shed removed. So mm -hmm. I, I I think you just have to keep um, keep on top of it with uh, with photos and some letters of support and. Um, uh, and try to get it something that's that's acceptable to both you and to the the owners. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm that's sorry. I'm, we can't really intervene and and and. Uh, no. uh, but but I definitely feel for you, and I I uh, I'll share your emails with the um, committee. I didn't get them in time uh, because I think they'll sympathize with you as well. It's it's uh, it's odd. Yeah. It's odd that all this is happening after things have been okayed, right? So, <laughs> but, but yeah, but it, you know the information is there, and um, and and you have some time, so good luck. Okay, well, thank you for the support. Okay, thanks for getting in touch with us. Um, we're gonna stay on here. Yeah. Um, thanks for letting us crash yeah. your meeting. Oh, you didn't crash, Monica. We, we this is what we're here for. So thanks for helping, uh, helping Lois and uh, Chris. Okay, um, thank you. Monica. <laughs> yep, thanks. Hey. Okay, thanks. We need Bye. to go into our meeting now. So we're gonna, we're gonna go. In a minute. There we go. Okay, um, so you can turn the recording off. <laughs> Please, Owen. <laughs>